Hey, everybody. I want to welcome you to Business Insights with Matt Millie. And I'm super excited this week because I actually have a, a celebrity here, uh, someone who made an amazing movie off of a real true life event. And in Business Insight fashion, you are going to hear a story from a, a rescue to a restore uh, and now to a story of redemption where someone who has gone through such trauma that normally would paralyze most folks, she's going to actually show and share with you exactly how you can overcome trauma in your life. And we're going to get to her story, but first, I'm going to go ahead here and cue my intro. Welcome to Business Insights with Matt Milia. I'm your host, Matt Milia. And in this podcast, we'll talk about the real, raw, uncut business success secrets you won't find anywhere else. Follow my journey from entry level to CEO. We discuss real actionable items you can plug into your business right away. To subscribe to our weekly top tips, you can go to www.mattpodcast.com and join our community of elite high-level performers. And if you're interested in our inside sales company, you can go to www.appointmentstoday.com to jump on a free strategy call. And now stay tuned for our podcast. All right, Gina, thank you so much for for coming on here and being a guest. I'm super I'm really excited to to talk with everybody and have you share a little bit about your story. And if you would tell everybody a little bit about yourself and uh, and who you are. I am Gina M. Garcia. I'm a filmmaker, entrepreneur, real estate investor, and a survivor of a childhood stranger abduction. So, Jeez. yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. I like the first part of my resume versus the last. <laughs> well, I could only imagine. And it sounds, I mean, I think the last part probably really built you into and the amazing person that you are today. Uh, and, and of course showed you how to, how you can go from such a traumatic event to being, to being the person you are today. Uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing with everybody, I mean, what, what happened and, uh, and tell everybody a little bit about the situation. So it happened October 12th, 1981. It was Columbus day. Uh, we were off from school and my, Mom had a great idea as far as let's have a girls' day out. So it was me and my sister and my mom. We went to the mall. We saw a movie. And as a teenage sister, and I was I was eight, was like, hey, let's go hang out in the mall. And my mom was like, okay, I can pay a bill over at Sears. I had a book report to do on Saturn. So uh, I was like, all right, let's go to the bookstore. And so I was in the bookstore. My sister was talking, like, I think from some friends from high school or something like that. And then um, I was just in the science section looking up books on Saturn. As simple as that, a man had come up to me. Um, he said he could help me find some books. And I, my dad was like, hey, if you get good, a good grade, I'll get you a new bicycle kind of thing. So I wanted to do anything I could do to get a good grade, you know? Sure. So uh, he said he had some books and magazines in his car. Um, it, 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 it's not the, the story that you hear like man grabs a child and throws him over his shoulder and like throws him into a van. It was, I went willingly. I went willingly because I was an innocent little kid. And I believe someone that showed me a badge and said he was a security guard could help me. So he led me out, out the mall. Um, I know we went through the Sears and Robux and any time my mom possibly could have seen us, you know, it was, it was that close. So uh, we went out uh, out of the back of the mall, um, got to his car. He never pulled out a book. He just pushed me into the car. He drove me to the back of the mall um, where he parked in front of the Lionel Playworld, which was a toy store um, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, it had a kangaroo as its mascot and a little Joey in the, in the pouch. And that was a place since my parents were divorced, you know, weekend dad would always take me to Lionel Play where I would be able to get a little toy. So um, in the car, I was sexually assaulted at knife point. Um, mm -hmm. I learned how to disassociate because I looked at the two kangaroos on the sign and I just kept on singing the commercials in, in my head as far as um, to not be present on the horrible and horrific acts that was happening to me. I had a knife to my throat. I was eight years old. Um, 
after he assaulted me, he uh, attempted to leave the mall um, by the grace of, or just a miracle, somebody had been driving and ran a stop sign. Um, and because they ran a stop sign, it, he, they went right in front of the car. Um, he had a screech to a halt and I jumped out of the car. Um, those kangaroos that I was singing that song uh, basically motivated me to jump. That's what kangaroos do. They jump and uh, they hop. So I hopped out of the car. I ran back into the mall half naked um, and found my sister. Wow. That's, that's crazy. And, and you made a movie on it, which I mean, cannot be easy to, to do. Uh, how long did it take you to make the film? Um, it, t it took a long time. Um, uh, I I wrote the script in 2008, um, and I wanted to you know tell my story. I wanted to produce it. I wanted um, as a business owner, and I wanted to produ you know produce my own film. So I decided to go to film school at 36. Um, I went to the Philippines to go to film school, um, also to understand my mother's heritage and things like that, and and her strength is on who she is. So. Um, went to film school in 2008, 2009. I moved out to Los Angeles. I worked on quite a few like little sets and things like that as production assistant, became associate producer on some projects and um, had the chance meeting of meeting Patty Jenkins, the director of Monster, who also uh, did Wonder Woman as well as the Wonder Woman, um, uh, the different Wonder Womans that, that are currently out. And I had asked her, uh, being a producer, I'm like, hey, can you pr can you direct my movie? And she told me, no. I hurt my feelings because I love your story. And she said, you know, you need to tell your story. And my response to her was, well, I'm not a director. She's like, well, when you're done, you will be. And so she ended up mentoring the the project and helped me with a script and, you know, first day on set and, and dealing with the cast and crew and and whatnot. And um, so we, we filmed in uh, 2012, um, part of it in, in Orlando, Florida, and then um, some of it in 2012 in Los Angeles. We shot a little in 2013. And so we had a completed film by, by uh, 2014. We screened it um, at a few festivals. But in the editing process, um, I felt the story I was telling wasn't mine. It, mm -hmm. it went across very Hollywood. There was a love story in there where there wasn't a love story that happened while this was going on. And I pretty much shelved the film. I wasn't comfortable with what was being released. Um, I felt like a victim um, in it. And then with that, um, I shelved it till, 20, um, till 2020 uh, mm -hmm. with COVID. I got COVID for Christmas. Um, from an employee, it was a nice little gift. And oh, yeah. I sat there and I was like, if I died, um, man, it would really suck that I spent all this time to make this film and no one knew my story untold would be always untold. So um, I kind of set out on a mission. I was like, I need to get this out there. And I was talking with my brother, who's also an entrepreneur and real estate investor. And he's like, well, when you originally edited the film, you were still a victim. And that's what comes out in the film, and which was brutal. He put this mirror up to my face and I wasn't comfortable with the mirror that I was looking into. He goes, if, if you want the world to see you differently, you have to cut it through a different lens. And that lens is the person that you are today. So I went in, I re-edited the film, uh, new music, um, new, new direction, new ending, and pretty much told the story that is, is, is my story. And, and the original version of the film was called Untold, and the new version is Untold, This Is My Story, because it truly feels, it depicts me on, on, on where I am today, and the, the journey that I went on, went on um, in the order that it actually happened versus the influence that I had from other people on how, it, how my story should be told. So in defining the, the new title, I felt, um, the only uh, proper title I could go with is Untold. This is my story. Wow, that's amazing. Now, this this gentleman that, and I don't know if you touched on this, but this gentleman that did this, you, what was his name? Uh, the person that, it was only confirmed in September of this past year after the movie mm -hmm. was having its world premiere that um, 
it was Otis Toole. It's the same person that took took Adam Walsh and murdered Adam Walsh. Um, he's a convicted serial killer. Um, he was convicted for uh, murdering six people. He confessed to murdering 108. Um, and I am the I'm the kid that came home. Wow. Talk, I mean, talk about uh, divine intervention. I mean, talk about yeah. That, I mean, that's just that that truly is amazing. Um, for for someone to be able to talk about that to get out and I mean in a lot of cases something like that would completely wreck someone for the rest of their lives I mean how how are you able to take what happened to you and use that as a I mean I don't know how how are you able to use that I mean that's probably the best the best question to ask well I, I'm not saying I like my life is perfect by no means. And I had my trials and tribulations, um, like anybody um, that goes through some form of trauma. Statistically, it's it's you dive into drugs, you you there's you know drinking, alcohol, suicide, teen pregnancies. There's all these horrible things that that people dive into that suffer from trauma. And then there's I I, I call it the the Oprah. Then there's the Oprahs and the Ellens, and they mask um, things by overachieving. And I did that approach because I didn't want to be seen as something dirty, that I wasn't successful, that, that, that the person that took me won. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, you know, uh, in sixth grade, I was student council president. I was in student council uh, most of my childhood. I played various sports. I played volleyball and basketball. I played uh, softball in college. Um, I, I went into the military. I graduated top of my class. All these things that were masking the hurt little kid. Because one of the things that happens is when you don't process things as a child, you have arrested development. And so what I was realizing is as I was achieving in some aspects of my life, I was failing in others. And that was my relationships with people and, and who I was either dating and my family and things like that. So um, a hate crime happened at my business. Um, some from some employees that uh, were stealing from me, uh, they retaliated by um, doing some ugly, nasty things. They vandalized my business, my car, my house, that kind of stuff. And it wanted up triggering a lot of the memories of what happened to me as a child. Most of it, um, I, I, I would say it was somewhat repressed. I always knew I was abducted, but what actually happened in the car as far as the assault and rape is something that I rather think of kangaroos than actually the, the the horrific stuff that happened in the car sure. so all that started coming back like a tidal wave i felt like i was drowning it's kind of like you know when you're um i'm you know i grew up in florida you spend a lot of time at the beach and when a wave just takes you out and you feel like you're like in a washing machine and all you want to do is try to get to the surface that's what ptsd felt for me all i wanted to do was get to the surface and breathe and from that point on, I realized I needed help. I went to the VA in Orlando, Florida, which a, an amazing group of women veterans um, and my therapist, uh, it was a PTSD group. And, and they, put a, they, they also put a mirror to my face and said, hey, stop telling the world you're okay. You tell the story of what happened to you and then you're smiling. No part of what happened to you is okay. But when, when you're trying so hard to be something that you don't want the world to see, you just smile. And um, let's face it, um, it's, that was nothing to smile about. So, you know, they taught me the ability to be transparent, to be vulnerable, to open up, to be honest with myself that what had happened to me wasn't my fault, um, that the only person to blame, yes, my sister was watching me. Yes, my mom went to go pay a bill. Um, my dad, why wasn't he there? My brother, and I could have blamed so many people. The only person to blame in this story is Otis Toole. He was the abductor. He was the rapist. He's the serial killer. Um, and I stopped blaming myself. It's amazing. Uh, so is this gentleman still alive? Um, he died in 1996 in prison. Okay. I mean, that's just horrific and for so many people that would that would just absolutely cripple them and there's something that we talked about before um what is the manifesting muscle 
Tell me a little bit about that. So at the earliest age, my dad instilled in me the, this simple little thing. Every little kid gets asked, what do you want to do when you grow up? And it could be a newscaster. It could be a movie star. It could be an engineer, a lawyer, a doctor, all those things. He would just say, tell people you want to be awesome. And like with that. that, it was the one step further was it's believing in yourself. So when you flex your manifesting muscle, it's believing that you can. And I think that's the one thing that people forget or don't realize, even when they, they've dealt with trauma, is you still can. You still, the the person that assaults you, the, per, the person that rapes you, the person that does these horrible things, they don't own you anymore. And 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 that that's that's the manifesting the, the manifesting muscle is just you flex it and and you show them that you you have something that you could believe in yourself and you could take back your life. I love that. That, that is so powerful because so many people are always asking, you know, why me or, and we run these thought patterns. We run these talk tracks in our mind and you're right. It's easy to point the finger of blame on someone and, you know, it's easy to say, oh, you know, it's these people's faults or, you know, and then, of course, you hold these grudges against members of your family or uh, or you blame yourself and you're thinking, well, what should I have done differently? And there's so many things that you could you could just go on and on and let it cripple you, let it stop your progress. And it's amazing what you've been able to accomplish. And now. So are you you're a real estate investor or developer? Or what do you do now? Um, I flip houses. Um, I do the small and large projects. I mainly focus on uh, properties on the water. Um, who doesn't want to live on the water? Hey. So uh, I moved from the Orlando area over to t you know the Tampa area, and um, so I do golf golf front um, properties, that kind of thing. Uh, and then I also have a business called Tricaroo. Um, I make small footprint electric vehicles. Um, Tricaroo, as in a tricycle and a kangaroo. So um, they're pretty much a cross between a golf cart, a mobility scooter, and a bicycle. They're two passenger electric vehicles, um, kind of like a golf cart alternative. So I do that. And also, you know, I made a movie. So uh, the interesting part with Trikeru, and I worked with a, a branding specialist, and um, I wanted to rewrite my history because my history of kangaroo was this violent crime, and now my mascot is a kangaroo. So I took wow. on that. That is so powerful because I didn't and, and I didn't even want to ask you what are your associations with a kangaroo because yeah. I could only imagine that I mean you could have gone to such a different way and looking at that through such a different lens and a different vertical thinking, you know, the kangaroo is evil when really in all actuality it was probably the only thing that kept you allowed you to disassociate with what was actually really happening at that point in time. Right. Right. And, and, and that's the thing is, is we get to, as long as we're alive, we get to rewrite our history. So you know, true. we can, we can define how it all looks like. Um, my first initial premiere in 2014, we did the premiere in the exact mall, the exact date and the exact time of my abduction. So I can sit there and say on October 12th of 2015 um, was the day of my first time I premiered my movie and told my story versus on October 12th, 1981 was the day I was assaulted. And so I think it's important that you make those choices on how you want to look at the rest of your life. And that was kind of what kind of defined it for me that I could rewrite even the movie that I made to tell it the way I want to tell it because everybody in the world is going to define who you are. And it's up to you to make that choice to define who you are. That's amazing. So the movie for everyone that wants to see it again, it's called untold. This is my story. Um, okay. it's, it's available on voodoo Amazon. It, uh, it airs at the, uh, will be on there at the end of the week. It's on Xbox, AT&T, Uverse. Um, it's also on Google play YouTube movies. And it'll be available in Barnes and Nobles, uh, Barnes and Nobles, Best Buy, Walmart, and Amazon uh, in May. That's amazing. Are you excited uh, to I'm, get your story out there? I'm very excited. I'm looking forward to hopefully we call you know the name Untold. 
um, no story should be untold. And yeah. so the simple fact that it's getting out there and hopefully we'll create dialogue. I, I showed my family implode um, and what it looked like to deal with PTSD from this kind of trauma. And um, uh, it, it's helped my family. We're, we're rock solid as far as um, how we are with each other now. And I hope it will help other families and survivors um, to be able to have dialogue um, in regarding the hard topics. That's amazing. And I mean, I, you know, again, I can only imagine what someone in that position would be going through. And the fact that you've used that as you, you've extracted the emotion from the situation, which I'm sure was not easy, but no, you extracted, you right. So, but you extracted the emotion from the situation. You took the lesson that you had yeah. learned from it and said, well, this is what I want to share with everybody because so many people want to suppress or hold down or, well, I'm going to pretend like it didn't happen. Like you said, where you have, you know, either the, the Oprah or the Ellen approach uh, where you, you try to over accomplish, over succeed uh, and make it so that you minimize what happened so that you can fit in with the, with the pack, so to speak, right. or with everybody. And that's, I feel like all that does is, and, and again, by no means am I uh, at all able to make these evaluations because I don't have the, the, the background in this and I've never dealt with something like it. But I can only imagine that what's going to end up happening eventually, it's going to resurface. And when it does resurface, it's going to be unbearable because you never dealt with it. And I, I mean, of course, mm -hmm. you had to deal with that. Um, what what advice would you give to anybody that had to deal with something, you know, a similar type of situation where they were abused or, uh, you know, in, in any type of situation like that? What type of advice would you give them to you know, help them follow in your footsteps? Um, use your voice. Tell your story. Don't bottle it up inside. No matter what, it will show up in, in some form of, of your current life. Uh, whether it's in your relationship with your partner, whether it's with your friends, whether it's with your family, how you deal with people at work, it, I promise you, it will show up. And when it does, it doesn't look pretty. So in order to get through, you know, to deal with it, you have to go through it. Um, find uh, people around you that you can have conversations with. Um, you know, you can find people in churches, there's, there's community centers, there's advocacy groups, there's lots of places that you can go for outreach, but don't hold it inside because it will eat you up. It can destroy you. And living through that, you let the abusers win and anyone that can survive any form of trauma, they're a winner by surviving. And that's the thing, you can truly get to the other side and thrive in your life. Um, like it, it, there's a quote in my, in my movie that my brother says, he goes, it's get out of the car already. I had to get out of the car of my abductor and I carried him around like this passenger for decades. And he dictated so much of my life. And I didn't want that anymore for myself. So my advice to anyone is, get out of the car, get out of, get out of that room that you're abusing, get out of that house, get out of that situation in your mind. And you could go on and live a beautiful and amazing life. That is awesome. Well, Gina, you are truly an inspiration an amazing person. I read through your bio. I watched the, I actually watched a clip of your movie. I am now going to look for your movie uh, because I definitely want to, I, I definitely would love to watch it and uh, have a little bit better of an understanding of everything that you've gone through. But uh, is there anything else that you want to add in before we close things out? Absolutely. If um, people wouldn't mind, if they were, are trying to find the film, uh, yes. they can find it on, on like I said, Voodoo, uh, Google Play, Amazon. Uh, if they want to reach out to me, uh, my website is GinaMGarcia.com. If you want to look up anything in regarding the film, it's untold dash movie.com. And I'm also starting a, a new podcast called the manifesting muscle. So, and that's manifesting muscle.com. And you could also see it on Facebook. So I added you Gina M Garcia.com. You've got lots of different ones. The, what was the other one? Manifesting muscle. Uh-huh. Is that a.com? Yeah, that is a.com. 
All right, let's see here. I'm going to we'll add this on here as well. So then that way, that way everybody can. Oh, there we go. Look at that right across the bottom. Manif manifestingmuscle.com. So, guys, I mean, for everybody that wants to get a hold of Gina, I mean, this is truly a miraculous turn of events. It's a miraculous. It's, it's a miraculous story. It's a I mean, really, in my mind, it's a story about, you know, really just fighting back and getting your life back and owning your choices and not not allowing these you know what you'd call demons of the past to pull you back and pull you down because it's very easy to do that it's easy to get in that blame game or uh, or you know of course just implode and it's amazing what you're doing so gina i'm so thankful that i was able to have you on uh, this was really really great and uh, for everybody that's watching We'll be here same time, same channel next week. Gina, thank you again so much. Uh, thank you, Matt. It was wonderful being on your show. Absolutely. My pleasure. Well, uh, for for everybody, let's, uh, let's all look at this as an opportunity to grow and an opportunity to, uh, an opportunity to realize that all the trauma and all the things that are in your past do not define you. You define you. So... Thank you again, Gina. And uh, for everybody that's watching here, have a great week. We'll see you same time, same channel next week. Thanks, Gina. Take care. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. <laughs>